Anyone else? I said in my previous retrospect that I was going to address much of the turbulence Marvel was having during Phase 2, but I opted to save it for this one because if ever there was a film in the MCU where the behind the scenes dramas were the most prevalent, it's this one. Notoriously, Patty Jenkins was originally signed to direct this film, a choice highly lauded by the masses. In fact, Natalie Portman was stoked to come back because of this choice. Unfortunately, the creative difference bug bit this production and Jenkins left the project. And then she made the first good DCEU movie, so bonus! While details vary, a lot of the blame for Jenkins' dismissal could be blamed on Feige and his insistence on littering in references for future films as opposed to focusing on this one. But more prominently, the brunt of the blame can definitely be placed on Ike Perlmutter. It's a matter of public record that Ike Perlmutter has something of a troglodytic attitude when it comes to this business, notoriously making racist statements when it came to recasting Rhodey in Iron Man 2, and in Iron Man 3, the character of Maya Hansen was supposed to have a more prominent role in the film to the point where she was supposed to actually be one of the primary villains, but Perlmutter shot it down, maintaining that no one's gonna buy toys of a woman. With that in mind, it's safe to theorize why Black Widow, Gamora, and Scarlet Witch kept getting the shaft merchandise-wise in the following years. So you can see how this probably didn't sit well with a lot of people. At this point, it was starting to come out that many directors of previous Marvel movies were none too pleased with how their respective films were getting screwed with. Kenneth Branagh hated the addition of the post cred stinger, and Joe Johnston wasn't particularly enamored with the mood on his set either. Even Joss Whedon had some conflicts during the first Avengers movie regarding the tone. Then there was Alan Taylor. After Jenkins left, Taylor was an unexpected choice to take the reins, but fans were still enthusiastic given his exceptional work on the HBO series Game of Thrones. People were hoping that he would inject a hearty helping of dramatic weight and epic storytelling, but unfortunately, we wound up with forced humor, a bog standard story, and easily the only villain in the MCU I can actually agree is a bad villain, reference close examinations. Thor The Dark World is entertaining and still a lot of fun, but by Mjolnir, this is about as filler as you can get. Tonally, the movie is all over the place with the aforementioned forced humor courtesy of an extraneous Cat Dennings. While there are some jokes at land, mostly they all come from the natural repartee between Hemsworth and Hiddleston. It can be said one of the benefits of Marvel's continued interference is the insistence that Loki get more screen time. One of the surprising things that audiences clicked with in The Avengers was Loki, so Feige insisted that they beef up his role in this film. It can be accused that more Loki meant less Malekith, and less Malekith meant less time to develop his character, but in the sphere of this film and what transpires for Thor and Loki in the future, it is right that this relationship gets further development. It's also a shame that they felt the need to keep going back to Earth, especially given that the one thing fans wanted to see after the first Thor movie was some of the different realms that were alluded to. The movie started off fine with the lush forests of Vanaheim. We even got to see more of Asgard that we didn't get to see in the last one. Even Jane Foster's involvement in the story was made more fun as we see her taken to Asgard, watching her geek out over everything around her, as well as butting heads with Odin. Hell, there's even a hint that there could have been some bonding with Frigga, which really would have enriched the character and made her... Death? More powerful. Instead, all we got is standard fighting a baddie plot with a trip to Svartalfheim, aka the Dark World, aka war torn wasteland with pea soup skies that looks like a quarry. It's kind of a sad day when a Sylvester McCoy era Doctor Who makes a quarry more foreboding and ominous than a multi million dollar production. Yeesh. As for Thor himself, there are hints of his character arc during the span of this story, but it gets derailed by so many other points of focus that his resolution at the end of the film just doesn't feel earned. The beginning of the movie makes it clear that Thor feels uneasy about taking the throne, but mainly because he wants to be on Earth with Jane, and it just seems to stick with that. We don't get the vibe that he realized that he can do more good away from the throne and being more hands-on as opposed to sitting on a throne and barking out orders. His aims in the film seem to be more about getting the ether out of Jane and saving her life. It's a hell of a lot of effort for Midgardian Poontang, particularly the type who dumps you off screen. Not blaming Portman on this, more Marvel for not thinking it through. So in closing, Phase 2 had a lot of developmental dramas resonating throughout and Thor The Dark World was the movie where it suffered the most. I suppose the reason we forgive it and just brush it off as a simple ride is that apart from establishing another Infinity Stone and placing Loki at the throne, there really wasn't much of an impact on the MCU as a whole, so you didn't really lose anything with this one except your time. But seeing as it still strives to be an entertaining diversion, you tend not to lose sleep over it. You drink it in? Toss it away and shout, ANOTHER!